Hi. Welcome back. Today I want to give some examples to you of how you can learn about atmospheric perspective. So my students in this class this semester have learned about linear perspective and that's when you can use perspective lines kind of like railroad tracks to create an illusion of deep space that the object gets smaller as it moves away from you. The lines end at a vanishing point, one point perspective on the horizon line, two point perspective, two points on the horizon line, three point perspective, three points. <clears throat> so atmospheric perspective uses different, mainly tint, tone, and shade to give you the illusion that an object is further away in space. So with that, there's a number of rules that you can follow. Some little tips and tricks that are helpful. If you look at this uh, cutout of a landscape, you can see in the foreground, the front, the things closest to you, that there's the darkest value. And you can see the furthest away that there's less dark of a value. There's less value contrast, less light and dark difference. It's more neutralized. So why would that be? If you were to walk over to these hills, would they be gray? No, they wouldn't. What it is is that we have little particles of light, little water particles that reflect light that are in front of us, in front of our eyes. So I have my eyes and in the distance I have the mountainside. And if the mountainside is very far away, I have more water particles between my eye and that object. So it gets blurred. And let's think of it, they're like little mirrors. So they reflect what is around them, the sky, the ocean, the land. So a lot of times people say, oh, well, yeah, okay. So as you get further in the background, it gets more blue. Oftentimes, it seems to be the case because it's water reflecting the sky, which is blue, the ocean would be blue, and so it could lean towards more of a cool color and be more realistic. In this example, I had the background color be orange and the foreground color be blue. So it became more orange as you went into the background, yet it was neutralized more. If it was a very bright sunset, there could be a pop of saturation in the sky. But that's, that's less typical, and this is more like you can always rely upon this to give your paintings the illusion of depth and space using the techniques of atmospheric perspective. or aerial perspective. The palette I used, I told you, was orange and blue. I mixed a neutral to be the shade. So this is the darkest shade of black. The foreground has the most value contrast, the most, sa most saturation contrast. Of course, depending on the lighting situation, but I'm just using a general idea. The middle ground has more of a middle value and it's becoming more neutralized as you get further deep, deeper in space. Here, this uh, like middle background has a mix between the orange and the blue and it's tinted white. As I move further back, it's more orange and then all the way to the background, it's mostly a tint with a tinge of orange, maybe a little bit of tone. Remember, tint is adding white, tone is adding gray, and shade is adding black. So in this example, I painted pieces of paper, and I had one that's an example of a shade. I would like you to do the same. The foreground was just playing around, having fun with the blue, leaving the white of the page, and mixing the black. And then I cut it out and pasted it on, it on here. And then I used here a toned, so that's with gray, toned 
blue. Here is a neutralized blue between gray or between the blue and the orange plus tinted white. Here, the orange tinted with white. The background tinted the most with white. So make one, two, three, four, five, six, six gradations and then cut it out to create a faux landscape. I find this to be the nicest way for my students to really grasp the idea of how you can actually be using color in the background and not just fading everything to blue. So think of a foreground color and think of a background color and then merge the two within this image. Cool. This is an example, a great example of atmospheric perspective because there is more kind of, eh, would that be fog or would that be smog? I'd say probably smog as this is a view from the Getty Museum to their um, cactus gardens onto the LA landscape. So it's probably some smog. Either way, little water particles are in the way. And so it seems to fade into, you hardly see the horizon line. It fades away into the distance. This is my nearby Point Vicente Lighthouse. It's from a local magazine. I thought that you might be able to access some magazines and make some work from there. So I want to give you an example of how to scale up. So one nice way to scale up is you can break it up into a grid that's each one inch squares, so smaller than this, and then make the grid on your paper maybe two inch squares or three inch squares, and that's an easy way to scale up. So what I decided to do is I like to use this little bit lazier method of transferring my drawing because oftentimes your drawing gets lost in your painting. Anyhow, so I just kind of draw as I paint. So I did my tic-tac-toe method, and then I did a loose sketch on my paper, this. I like to have the spine on the left side so it doesn't get in the way of my hand. So I have the, the focal point, which is the lighthouse. I didn't put it exactly on one of the sweet spots. I kind of am letting the, this palm tree and the lighthouse share the focal point strength or yeah, needs or whatever um, and then palette so for this one I do want to use a limited palette because I want your focus to be on tint tone and shade I think I will use hmm, I'm really torn because it is a full color spectrum yeah I'm gonna just say go for it and make sure you use tint tone and shade but we will go ahead and you can mix Per your landscape. I'm just going to mix for what I see here. There's not a magenta, but there is a lovely orange of this earth. Hmm. I want you to see this. Let me see if you can see. Yeah. It's hard to get both of them in there, huh? I don't want it to get dirty. So let's do this. Good enough. Okay. So let's find this orange. It'll be more vibrant, but we will add tint tones and shades as we move along, and we can change the color just a little bit to make it a tiny bit more green, too. This yellow is not very strong, so I'll add some more. So I'm just matching to that orange. Sure. I bet there's one moment with this orange that's kind of like this. I'll go for it. And then I want a yellow because the highlights will need it. And then green and blue. I'm going to have it be kind of like the color wheel, except in a line. The 
this green. There's some yellow greens. There's more pure greens. Let's have a more yellow green. And then the blue we will need it neutralized. So I'm gonna have that blue, but I'm also gonna have one that's mixed with this orange, which lucky for me is the opposite. And I know that I can use the complement, the opposite color, to make lovely a lovely palette that's cohesive. bit just with the blue and start tinting things. Green does need a little tint, but not too much. And I'll tint as I go with the orange. So this lovely um, neutral that I mixed up here, oh, let's add the black too. But this lovely neutral that I mixed at the top here, I'm gonna go in and the first thing I'm gonna do is fill in where I have shadows. And that is often called an underpaint, underpainting. It helps you lay out the image and get the idea of where your lights and darks are. Just start with an angled brush and I'll use it to sort of watercolor technique and I'll look at my image and see okay where are the dark areas where do I want to keep this dark for sure and oftentimes it's fun to go ahead and use an opposite color like for example on this lighthouse it could really make that blue pop, because remember, that's one of my focal points, right? It could really make the blue pop if I, use, if I tone the underpainting with the opposite color of it. So, the opposite of the blue is orange. So I'm going to do that, because I think that's fun. And this is just a loose laying down of paint. We want to not get too stuck up on it because we can always paint over it. That's what's that benefit of acrylic paint is its ability to just paint over. And if you ever make a mistake, paint it out white, start over. Now this foreground, it does have darker right here because I know there's a little crevice it looks like there's a path but nobody can hike there I've tried you can hike all near around it if you wanted to do a wash of color you could even grab your sponge probably I'll use that in the background of the sky too so we start with the foreground for the underpainting because that's where the darkness is. But once we really start painting, we work back to front. That's a traditional mode of painting, particularly with landscaping. 
so I'd like you to try it. It's easy to get excited about the details of a piece and jump into those. Yet, the layering has a more realistic effect if you work back to front once you're on, onto the regular part of the painting. Oh, the, um, the C. The C needs to be straight. You could, you could wait till it dries and tape it. Where is it in the C? Is it there? It is there. Okay, I have a line there already. I'm just gonna go all the way across because the most important thing in the image, just like in photography, is that you have a nice straight horizon line if you want your image to be realistic. And this is darker than the C will be. This just lays it out. And how about the sky? It's more vibrant, but I do want to remind myself it's darker around the edges. They were intentional. This is a wet. Wet, wet. So, there we go. This is, I could take this mixed media paper down. Okay, so now I wanted to get, have a special moment with some orange, and I will darken it for the lighthouse. When I paint over it with the blue, the little bit of edges of this orange will still show, and it'll help that blue. Remember, if you have complementary colors next to each other, they pop. If I have, like the, the sea is just as dark as the foreground, so maybe I'll come in and be like, oh no, this is darker. A little bit darker color. It's like I'm, I constantly am leaving myself little notes about into the future. That's why we work out the drawing beforehand to, up to a point so that we don't fuss too much. Maybe a little inch, just a little start drawing. So I'll let this underpainting completely dry. And then I will start working on the background. If I thought something was way too dark, I can get my paper wet. No, it's already too dry. Okay. Especially want that to dry. Put a book on it. going I will mix more for the background needs a lot of white remember acrylic paint dries dark I'll take a little bit of that blue put it in the white Bit. It's a larger 
piece of paper so I could use a bigger brush but I'm not really wanting a ton of fussy brush strokes so I'm using my sponge and I figure you all can find a sponge somewhere. I had left a little whisper of a drawing to show where the white clouds start. Remember, think of the drawing as, and some of the marks for painting, as little notes for you to reference as you go along. put it both on the ocean I'll put it through all of it and I'll repaint the foreground I'm just doing it light enough transparent enough so I can still see where my drawing sits on the canvas or paper as it would Let's see that white has kind of a yellow, blue, I'll neutralize it. Let me show you what I'm doing. Remember, more neutral as you get into the background. So that means tinting is a great way to neutralize as you get into the background. Pretty good. I may start defining this tree more. You could use pure white and then paint over it to get it just the right tone of the background. It might be a good time to come in again with the sponge. Yeah, let's see. It would be a good time for me to put this a few feet. Oh, come on over. Come read it to us. You can still talk about it. Yeah. I'm going to let it dry for a second. Okay. Playing with mom is fun. We play wolves mm -hmm. and horses. It's our favorite game. He needs practice. I wish we could play all day. I like dressing up like a fox. Thank you, Bellamy. Great work. What's that? Um, this? Mm -hmm. Palette knife? Got a little dirty, huh? Mm -hmm. I like to use a palette knife to mix up my colors of paint. Okay, so I just throw in a couple of while it's drying. I'll do some maybe throw in some detail work.
So those bits that... How'd you do that? Of which part? You have to watch the video, right? <laughs> you could. You want to subscribe to my channel? You need to come up with a, a name well, for I my subscribers. You need to help me out. Paint artist? Okay, paint artist. Artist. I always like to say artist and remind people that while they're doing making art, they are artists. That's a good one, BB. Thank you. Lost my windows. Alright, we'll say here and then I can re. This is good timing because Bye. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna put this painting <clears throat> like 10 15 feet away from me and make some judgment calls on what needs to be shifted and changed. defining limits of things. That's what I'm interested in doing right now. This is the bottom of the brush before it goes down the cliff side. Using a method called scumbling. So it's dry on dry paint. The paintbrush is not loaded with wet paint, with watery paint. So it's dry on dry scumbling. Offers you te texture, so you'll have more texture in the foreground. This is more in the middle ground, but it is my focal point, so I'm going to allow it to have a little bit more texture than other objects in my middle ground. And I'll probably make it less of a dark value as I work on the painting. So let's see. It's pretty dry. Is it going to drip? Yeah, that one spot's going to drip. I don't really mind drips. I'll put it about 15 feet away, okay? So I'm going to put it here. Oh, I don't want it to be backlit. Here, I'll stand 15 feet away. I'll check things like the horizon line. I'll check the location of things if I'm missing something because when you're so up close to something, you miss out on viewing it a particular way. Okay, so it was good. I thought that the horizon line was too wobbly. Um, I probably will bring in some tape. Yeah, it's ready. I'll do it now. We worked on the background after you had done your underpainting. Then we came to this middle ground. So this is good timing. The horizon lines in like the middle background area. Think of it like a stage. Background, middle ground, foreground. So I'm not happy with the wobbliness of my mark making when I did the horizon line. So why not use tape, right? Use what you got. I probably will fade it out with a white and then come back in and, and make any adjustments, give it some more love. But just go right over this line. If, if you don't press down the edges of the tape, it can go underneath the tape. If you want to go a step further, 
to really seal it. Use your flow additive, which is a medium. Just lightly put it over it, let it dry. You can always use a blow dryer on your paintings too if you want it to dry faster. And then once it's tacky, go over the tape edge. You can tape anything off that you want. The edge of the lighthouse, anything architectural could be smart to add some taped edge to get a real sharp edge to it. But remember, you don't want it to be a sharp edge if it's all the way in the background for atmospheric perspective. That would not aid your illusion. Good, good. I think I'll pull it up now because I want to work on the rest of it. I'll keep this tape in case I want to use it. Because I think I'll use it around the lighthouse. Oh, I lost. There's probably a wet spot. Oh, see that? That's because there's a wet spot. So if I waited longer before I put tape on it, that wouldn't have happened. I'm just going to put some white paint over it and then I'll go in with my underpainting color. And no one will even notice. It'll just become part of it. Okay, so that's good. I like that a little bit better. I think I will help edge the water. Just kind of honing it to be a different value. Just a little bit. And then I think I will jump into the bushes. Yep, we'll jump into the bushes. I should work left to right because I'm right handed. If I put this pure green on here, it will scream. Maybe I could put it here because it's all the way in the foreground, but I need to neutralize it. I can do a little bit of the black, shading it. Yeah, I'll start with that. Work dark to light. That's nice, that's nice. I'm just going to keep it light, meaning it's not thick globs of paint. And I'm gonna use like these guys. Maybe bringing a little bit more of their personality. Still have paint on my brush. So I just look back and forth at my source image just to keep evaluating and decide which way should the brush go to best serve the object that you're creating.
time is it? Okay, so I worked left to right. I'm gonna have to take a break because we have a family Zoom meeting. And I'm leading it. So I neutralized, I tinted a bit of a green yellow. I'm gonna put it here as my last thing before I take a little break and then come back to the painting. Breaks are good. Don't do it all at once, you know? That's what's beautiful about painting, is you can leave it. You, you know, getting inter interrupted totally can suck, but it is workable. As long as you can preserve paint. I know it's trickier with acrylic. Good, because I need to see how this yellow dries. Let's see how it dries. A little bit of yellow up here, too. I want to remember that. Yellow there. So there's the sun coming from the right. I want to make sure I honor. Start to give whispers of what will happen here. Give it a break.